going rolling. These are the stories of Rolling Prairie, Indiana, told by lifelong residents who lived, prospered, and enjoyed the small town from the 1920s until around 1960. We sat down with several of them and had a nice conversation, reminiscing about the years gone by. Good times, great stories. They may not all be true, but they're good stories all the same, so let's get rolling. Well, it, it started really because uh, about uh, a mile or so south of here, there was a bigger town than Rolling Prairie back in the beginning in 1854 called Byron. Well, the biggest, I think, the biggest thing, the attraction, because they always compared Rolling Prairie to Byron. See, Byron should have been what Rolling Prairie is. When they built the railroad, they came north of Byron and went through Rolling Prairie, and that created the town at that time there. Yeah, well, it was just a small town, and it had a, a, a tremendous history because it was one of the first communities around here. It dates back to 1832, and this is not, it didn't grow like Laporte or Michigan City or anything like that there. It's a small town atmosphere, and it really impressed me. One of the early settlers was Ezekiel Provolt. In 1831, he and his wife pioneered the new land and homestead at a place near the Rolling Prairie Cemetery. The house still stands there today. They were some of the early settlers and friends with their neighbors, the Potawatomis. Provost was on the first one. He built a log cabin there, and it was my understanding that there was a, a flowing a well there, and the Indians used to come there, and uh, because of the water, and uh, they were friendly Indians. Although this guy built his cabin and he put an extra thick door on there for protection. <laughs> But uh, that's the way the town got started, and that was about in 1832. Life in America was rapidly changing, growing. States were being admitted into the Union, and a trail of tears ensued. That's when he started gathering up all the Indians and uh, started heading them west, the trail of tears. And uh, that happened at uh, a place they called Plum Grove, which is about uh, a mile or so east of here, somewhere in the neighborhood of the uh, junction of Highway 2 and 20 now. What, yeah. happened, what happened there? Well, they gathered up all the Indians and they put them in an encampment there, and then the army moved them west, marched them west, and a lot of them died. And that's why they call it the Trail of Tears. And it was the saddest thing that this country ever did was to take these Indians out and the way they treated them. This was their land. This is their country, and we had no right to do that. Everyone needs a place of one's own. Fresh air, goodness, things we encounter and believe to be ours. Rolling Prairie. It got its name back in 1853 from a postmaster who was informed one day that the town's current name, Portland, was already taken. Looking out over the native grasses and rolling hills of the region, it was an easy choice, and Rolling Prairie, Indiana was now on the map. Life was good. A local commuter train called the Interurban stopped daily in Rolling Prairie. It was, it was 1929, and I came from Laporte to Rolling on the Interurban to see my grandpa and grandma, and I couldn't wait to get there till that train stopped so I could get off and run up the hill and get to my grandpa's hardware store. Of course, that was Reese's. That was there from the time Rolling was a store. They had a Reese's hardware store. Just like an old-fashioned hardware would look with the tr tracks up, up above, you know, and uh, the, we the ladder that rolled on the tracks. And we used to look in the showcase and see all those beautiful marbles and Grandpa let us pick out a marble once in a while for our keepsake and things like that is what I remember. And that's where my dad bought my first breaking plow when I was 10 years old and we still got it. And I used to have a team of mules and an old gray bay mare and we had hitched them up and I plowed a lot, and my dad had a plow, and he'd plow on that, and I had the riding plow, and so we plowed together. It was a simpler time. A few farm implements, fertile soil, and a cracky wagon were all one seemed to need. Well, I can tell you a little history. 
You know, I talked to Barb Nickerson about we come from the horse and buggy era. Like I say, our generation, there's not a generation seen to change as we have. Because I said we come from horse and buggy, and Ray, I can prove it. We lived at Hudson Lake, and my dad had to go to a family funeral in Illinois, and my dad was going to shred corn, and I had to go come near Rolling Prairie to tell the farmer we was going to, my dad was going to shred corn Monday. I said, well, while I'm this close to Rolling, I'll just go up and see Barb Nickerson. Well, where she lived, there was a road off of Mechanic Street in around her house. So I took my uh, horse and on my cracky wagon and around and around I went. And she said she never seen her grandpa as mad as she saw him today because he knew what I was doing to that poor horse. I never saw him angry, period. I never saw my grandfather raise his voice and get upset. But that day he shook his fist at Wayne and told him to go on home. <laughs> I don't know why he was acting up. Why was well, he acting well up? that's normal. I wanted to show off in front of you what I, I could do with uh, a horse and buggy. I could have cared less. <laughs> <laughs> so we got the proof that we're from the horse and buggy days. <laughs> we had uh, three grocery stores. We had a garage, Jones's Garage. Of course, Peacock was well known all over the country. Peacock Fountain Inn was, they employed quite a few people, you know, because I know my mother-in-law, she worked there and she can remember Bob Hope went through and people like that went through here because if they was going, that's the only way they could get mm -hmm. going through 20 because 20 went right through rolling, you know. Chicago to New York City. The road went right through downtown Rolling Prairie. It was a heyday for many. Small town USA. There was a time when these little towns thrived in America. Bustling sounds of commerce, community, and the oh-so-familiar faces filled the streets and sidewalks. They were the heartbeat of America, crossroads of our land, paths which led to points where people shared ideas, hopes, and dreams. But what happened? Well. Because there was so few people here, McDonald's could not support a, uh, a business in Rolling Prairie. And these were small business people. We had a dime store here, we had a grocery store, it was an IGA. Uh, the hardware store was locally owned. People had been here for years and years, the local family. And uh, when uh, a business comes in, a big business, they want to have people and customers and that. And when you buy, start up a business, you got to have a workforce. And uh, so the town just never grew for this purposes. And a lot of the people around here did not want the town to grow. They wanted it to remain a small, close-knit community. Uh, I think it was right before World War II, or either right after World War II, they took Highway 20 and bypassed the town. Well, originally, see, originally, uh the, why they shut it down is because there were so many accidents, there was no bridge, there was, of course, no lights or anything at that time, and a lot of accidents, so they, uh, and they started to build a, the big four-lane highway, you know, the new highway, and that, that just isolated Rolling Prairie. <laughs> well, that, that just took the town down because the traffic is going by it, and, uh, but it still picked up Bob's barbecue. And at one time, the intersection of 2 and 20 was supposed to be right at Bob's Barbecue. And they were going to put in a clover leaf. And Mr. Wiley, that owns Bob's Barbecue, if I correct, did not want to sell land to the state. And there was a big hubbub about it. And so instead of the intersection being there with the clover leaf, they moved it down about a mile to where it is now. Well, I don't know whether it draws people anymore because the town is mostly of old people now, it seems like. I don't know too many really new people in here. Most of them are older, like, like us. And I don't think with the town the way it is now, of course, now they're building stores. It might change. Well, that road come in by the, by the cemetery and it went down through Rolling Prairie 
and instead of, uh, of, of turning down and going underneath that viaduct, you go straight. And there was a road that went by um, the house, that, uh, the farm, that farm. It went uh, south of that farm and over the railroad track and dropped into Bootjack, and that's, then it picked up uh, the 20 and went in, into New Carlisle, yes. But then you're coming back underneath the viaduct and you come down and, and you turn to the left and you're coming this way and uh, the first building of it was a, was a filling station. And then you come up to Peacock Fountain Inn. Um, and then, and I think in about 19, it was 1936, 37, something like that. Well, 35, they built a school and it's where the, where the uh, memorial is. That was the original school. Okay, now you got the new school and you're coming this way and there's, um, you go up a couple of three blocks on the right hand side was a telephone office. Um, and then on the corner of 4, 425 where the bank is now was a Dr. Fuller's house, which is a big, big place. And then you, you come up farther, you come to the Methodist Church and then across, across that was another filling station, Gaffle. Um, now, at Gaffles, then, then you'd go down the main street of Rolling. The downtown of Rolling Prairie then was uh, where the beauty shop is now, that was a pool hall. And next door to it was Hacker's Grocery Store. And then there was Oscar Halder's Barber Shop. And then Kegabine's Appliance Store. And then across the street was where Virginia Zook lived with her grandparents. And then next to them was the Gleaner Hall. And next to that was the Porter family's house, Tom and Paul Porter. And across the street from that, which would be right down from where we are now, was Dick Stevens' store. And next to it was the little tiny library that was nothing more than a shed, really. And then Bozick's, where we're at now. Well, when I first, to start out, the used to be a standard filling station right where the fire station sits now. And then as we crossed the street, there was a bank over there, and above the bank, it was a Masonic Hall. And from the bank, you'd walk just down the sidewalk, and that was the Reese's Hardware. And they sold implements, Oliver implements at that time. And that's where my dad bought my first plow. And like that, and then Hunt's Hardware, the little post office was next. And then your hard, uh, Hunt's Hardware, then your blacksmith shop. Then you cross the street to Nobles, and Bozik's added after Nobles. But I, I knew Bozik's real well, and I used to go in there a lot. But uh, then you go on down to the, and that's where the Massey Harris and for, uh, Massey Harris dealer was at that time, and that was Miss Bob Wiley and George Schultz. And then the after they went out of business, the, the grocery store went in there and was there until the new grocery store was built. There was a park, there's the Gleaner Hall on the other side, it's still standing there, and this bare lot that's there, that was a, a park. And a fellow by the name of Andrew Stoner used to take care of that. He, he lived right across the street from right by the uh, church where the library is of today, he, that was his next house, that was his. But he had checked things every morning and be up there. And then we, the elevator, that was a great place to go. Then they had that livestock market, and that, well, I was a little boy when that dad had, was there. But I went with dad on a wagon, and we had to take a load of pigs, and had a wagon, box wagon, and you put them in that and take the team and go. And then Wheatbrook's added, it was Mr. Wheatbrook, he had his little gravel, uh, he started out real small, he had gravel and blocks, cement blocks and like that. He started, when they first started, they were in a, just a little, oh, it wasn't much bigger, than, it wasn't as big as this room. And uh, then they built on and got to be real nice and big. Well, you know, so one thing I'm, we kind of forgot is where 
or in the corner of 425 opposite of the, of the, uh, of the bank was um, Jones's garage. I mean, that was the ultimate. I mean, he had, he had a record that he could lift up semis. Of course, they were, the semis were smaller then than they were today, but he bought a Greyhound bus and made one. Uh, boy, everybody in the, in the northern part of Indiana, they'd always call him to upright these trucks. Yeah. And they stayed open 24 hours a day because that was, 20 was, uh, you know, the main road. And of course they stayed open 24 hours a day. And right beside of it, there was a small little coffee shop, which was handy for the people that was traveling, you know. At one time, when, when Highway 20 ran down the main, down Michigan Street and came out over there around where Bobby's Barbecue is now, there were 13 gas stations in this town. That's what they tell me now. There were 13 gas stations. Well, I worked, I worked at there where Family Express is now. Um, it was a standard station, and uh, I'm trying to think of a guy's name, but I can't tell you who I worked for. Yes, Dick Evil who went to our church. Dick Evil's Standard Station was there, where the Family Express is now. And then across the road from that was Mrs. Schellenberger's house. Schellenberg had a filling station for a long, long time because that Schellenberger home was built, I don't know if you heard the story, but they built closets in them. Back in those days, they didn't have closets, and people used to want to see what the closets was like. The big thing was the, the Saturday that Notre Dame played football. Oh my God, we would sell 900 gallons of gasoline in one day, you know. Well, I'd stop and think, you'd go to Schellenberger's right across there, they had the old pump, a uh, gas pump, so if you went down there and you, uh, you wanted a five gallon of, of gas, you pumped it up to the five gallon mark and you shut, you know, shut it off and put it in your gas tank. There, there was no, it didn't rattle around, you know. <laughs> yes. And it, you could only get, the max amount you get in that thing was 10 gallon. But the town stayed small. A lot of things happened here, but the town still stayed small and close. Oh, back in years, you, you never locked your house. I mean, pull the door shut and go ahead and go. But no, different than it is today. My parents would go on vacation every year, and I don't think we had a key to our doors. Our doors were never locked. I think everybody enrolling, in a way, minded their own business. They didn't really stick their nose in your business. They didn't call the police on you if your dog ran in their yard. People were just people. I moved back, I was gone for over 30 years. And I moved back, it's kind of nostalgic. You, you wish it could be the way it was back in the 50s when I was a kid, when everything was so safe. Even though all the neighbor women did know your business and they'd yell at you, you know, for things. Everybody was your mother in this town. You just felt safe. Bad things didn't really happen around Rolling Prairie. And when something bad did happen, it, it was just a shock. Well, everything was the church with, with my family, with our family, yes. All the activities were the church. We didn't have any other activities on it. But everything that, I, that we were connected with and, and that my husband and I were connected with, and all of us was the church. Mrs. Schellenberger was a, a, a great leader in the Christian church at that time. Uh, Reverend Thomas was the, one of the ministers that was there. Frances Mitchell and her mom went there. And the Brewers, Claire Brewer and his family. One of the things that I think is sad that I remember so well from my church was the Sunday before Memorial Day, when Sunday school was, when Sunday school was over. We all got a little flag and we all marched down to the cemetery singing Onward Christian Soldier and would put the flags on the graves of all the veterans in the, 
in the cemetery. And I mean, it was just wonderful. It was just wonderful. It made you feel more patriotic that you were doing something for veterans. And now the VFW does that. I think that's so sad. Still see her parade into the classroom with the letter in her hand, shake, waving it, and she says, yes, who well, this is from, boys and girls, and it was a letter from John F. Kennedy, and he was supposed to come to our classroom to visit, and he apologized to her in the letter that he had to cancel, that he had other things going on. And I can remember her saying, look, boys and girls, it's on Tiffany Stationery, and none of us knew who what Tiffany Stationery was, but she was so excited. I can remember Bobby Kennedy coming through, and they had a motor um, cade, and the school was let out, and he drove through so the kids could see him. Well, that's another thing I wanted to say, that people, people, uh, we neighbored. You know, we, today you don't, well, we got, new neighbors just today. You know, I have no idea who they are. Um, that's a shame because, you know, so many things you can, you can do together. I grew up in Evansville and you did good to know your neighbors. And same way with Kingsford Heights. You, you do good to know your neighbors next door to you or something like that, say. And uh, because everybody's got their own little group of people that they're with and newcomers coming in, everybody seems to look down on it. But in Rolling Prairie, it's just the opposite. People will stop you on the street and say, hey, you you're, don't know you, what's your name? And uh, you get to know them, and they were friendly people. When, when I was in third grade, I was the culprit of the family. I came down with whooping cough and mumps at the same time, and then I gave it to, and my mom was in the hospital, and I gave it to five of my brothers and sisters, and it was during the winter, and we got this wonderful case of oranges from Hunts, they were in Florida, they had heard we were all sick. I mean, that was the kind of people that lived here. But if somebody had a problem, or if there was a death in someone's family, anything like that, then everybody was there for you. When my brother, uh, Cyril and my sisters were sick with the mumps and stuff. All kinds of people brought things and left on the porch for us because our house was quarantined. When other things happened in town, everybody rallied around the people that needed help. You know, when, when Mr. Stavak died, the terrible way that he died, the whole town cried. It, it's that, it was that kind of a community. There were just such wonderful families here in town. They just looked out for, for everybody. It just was just nice. Years ago when my granddad, Ellsworth Stoner, was living, he had a heart trouble. And in the wintertime, the roads were real bad. They, were, they couldn't go north of his house. And so the county highway would come in, and he had a nice driveway. They'd come in and make a turn with their snowplow, and Doc Brown would follow them in every day. He'd be, check every day on Granddad. But Weinstock was good about that, too, because he came out the, day, the night my dad passed. We called him, and Dad was having his heart pains, and Doc gave him a shot. And he, Dad sat in the front chair, in a chair about like this one here, and he said... Uh, his pain began to let up and he said to Doc, he says, is this the way this is, that shot's supposed to work? And Doc says, yeah. Doc says, would you like to go lay down? And is this going to be? Do you want it to be? <laughs> well, that's my dad's passing. And yeah, I was right there when my dad passed. And his eyes seemed to make a circle turn in his head. And Doc says, he's gone. And I seen Dr. Weinstock take his fist and hit my dad so hard. If that was to bounce that to give it, and it was all over. And that's how my dad passed. Well, you know, another thing is we we had some wonderful people enrolling. Uh, Dr. Fuller. Um, you know, they took his they took his uh, license away from him because of the uh, army camp out there. You know, that he was working for him. He 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 run there 16, 18 hours a day. And, and I, my understanding, and I don't know how true this is, but my understanding he was taking drugs to keep himself going. And it, 
got ahead of him, so they took a license away from him. But he was a, he was a good medical doctor. I mean, he, uh, you know, he, he'd, he'd fix you up, never had a charge, never charge you, you know. Yeah, I, I hate, I'd like to see a doctor back in there today, but it just don't seem to work out. Bob's Barbecue is at the location that Jenny raises. It's actually the same building, the same design and everything. They didn't really change a lot of it. The, ba the heydays of the town was when uh, Notre Dame would have a uh, football game and the Greyhound buses would come through here and they would stop at Bob's Barbecue for dinner before they would go to the football game and stop at Bob's Barbecue afterwards and, uh, and eat before they went back to Chicago or wherever they were going. But it was really busy. I mean, I can remember the cars backed up all over the place down there. I think all the kids when I was young that were old enough worked out there. When I was in high school and worked at the barbecue, there would be just, people would be lined up all the way around the building to get in to eat. It was extremely busy and we would have busloads of people. But at that time, the intersection was still right there by Bob's Barbecue. They hadn't moved the highway out yet. I would work after school, and I worked Saturdays and Sundays, and on Saturday nights, I wouldn't get off work until three o'clock in the morning. And then the next morning, I'd go in and open, help open up for the breakfast, Sunday breakfast so that I'd have Sunday afternoon off to get my schoolwork done. But we would just be so, so busy. And there was, uh a motel behind it and there were cabins behind it and we would rent the rooms for the motel. You know, 13 years old, <laughs> motel rooms and hotel, the cabins and stuff. And it was like $6 a night for a cabin, $5 a night for the motel room. I can remember him telling, laughing one time about he had been robbed a couple of times. This was in the 40s and so his father was going to stand guard for him, and so he was going to sleep there all night for him. He curled up underneath one of the booths with a shotgun, and the people came in and snuck in and robbed the place, and he was just sound asleep with the shotgun. <laughs> so he got to work, went in the next morning, and he's robbed again, but his dad, his dad was sound asleep. <laughs> Bob Riley, uh, I remember, uh, see, I was probably 16 years old, I got a Model A Ford, and uh, we'd always go out there and get a get a Coke, you know. And uh, it was like quarter to eleven at night, and the state trooper says, "Well, he looked at his watch. And he said, you know, he said uh, fifteen minutes is curfew time. You better get home." Yes, sir. So we get out in the car, and we saw him take his car and going into the port on two. So we. This guy said, what the hell do we have to do that for? Why don't we just, let, let's go back and get another Coke. So we did. I turned around and I parked the car, went up there and I got my Coke and I got one sip of it and that state trooper, trooper took me. By the, you know, nap the neck, see the pants, and laid me across his car and paddled me in front of people. Think what would happen today if they did that, you know. But I, I idolized him. It was, you know, it was still going in this, Late in the 60s, there was still stuff, you know, a little bit of a restaurant there. But it was lots of places for parking there, and it was right on the highway. It was, it was quite the booming place. There used to also be, or where the school is now, across the street from that was a big restaurant that was very uh, classy restaurant at that time. It was a Peacock Inn. That was a, it was an actual inn built probably back in the 20s or, or 30s. It uh, was owned by a fellow named Offenbacher. He had landscaped the place. He had trees, ornamental trees that you wouldn't find around here. Uh, ginkgos and buckeyes and different things that everybody didn't have in their yard. Uh, he had fish ponds, uh, a gazebo that was built up on a hill, big apple orchards, uh, cottages. There was half a dozen cottages around there. Uh, the old horse stables where they put the horses and they, uh, the wagons for, for overnight if you wanted to stay. Oh yes, that was very popular and they had the Peacock Fountain Inn 
and they had the other restaurant, so they had two places, and he had it real fancy, and oh, yes. It was a nice place to eat, and of course, we had, they had room for the dance and like that, so. I can remember seeing pictures where they actually had peacocks in the yard, and there was the most beautiful fish pond there. When I used to ride my bicycle when I was a kid, we'd always stop and look at the fish in the fish pond. It just amazed me that there were lights up in the tree. I couldn't figure out how in the world they could have. They were like Christmas lights up in the tree. And my aunt and uncle, uh, Fred and Teresa Nicholas, bought the old Peacock Fountain Inn. When we took it over and opened it up, we opened it up as a restaurant that was reservation only. We only took larger parties. I think 10, 10 or more was the smallest we would go. Uh, a lot of weddings, anniversaries, graduations, uh, office parties, a lot of office parties. Alice Chalmers used to have a lot of their office parties out there. Uh, we could seat 200 people in the large dining room and 100 people in the small dining room. Uh, they specialized in uh, chicken and ham. Everything was family style. So you got two vegetables and your potatoes and uh, Homemade, everything had homemade rolls. They did that till uh, we closed up about 1960. There was a movie theater, or they used to show movies in? Yeah, they had a billboard down in a depot street, and they would come in and put, put Tom Mick, Earl Rogers, and all Hang that. a screen on the on telephone pole. On a Wednesday the Thursday. And there's three free movies, yes. but the stores would stay open to draw all the people in. The, but you sit in your cars and watch the movies. You're kidding. Yeah. Did, you, did you ever do that? Oh, yeah. I did that as a kid, sure. That's how I, Get a blanket and go up there and, and sit there and watch the movie on the pool. That was the thing to do. What else you had to do, you know. Um, I can remember when I was a kid, they would put a screen up right here at the bottom of Depot Street. And then we would sit out just right out front here and they would show movies. They'd do it during the summer. They didn't have a movie theater. They just brought in the, the movie and we brought our crates, our boxes that we had and took them right out here on the hill. And they went down below the hill someplace. I don't know exactly where. But it, it was wonderful that we had those weekly free movies back in 1936. Couldn't afford to go to go to town. Oh my gosh, it was 25, 25, 30 cents to see a movie. This was free. Well, it was 1949 before I saw my first TV. And that was at Cape Cod. There was something else. I couldn't believe that. It had a howdy doody on. <laughs> well, we always went, we always went to hunts because uh, we could buy parts for our bicycles, bicycle chains and handle grips and uh, wheels and tires, and you could buy BBs for your BB gun, and uh, I think you'd buy BB guns there too. When I was about 14 years old, I had a 22, and a box of 22 shells was 15 cents. And uh, I'd go in and buy a box of shotgun shells, we could take it out to Wheatbrook's dump. And when, the, when, the, when it got dark, we had a, we had a, a Coleman Lantern, we'd light and we'd shoot rats. And, and uh, uh, you'd go in, you'd, you know, if you could save up enough money to get two boxes shell, boy, you really had it made. <laughs> and they always took care of you, you know, if you broke a, a playing ball and you put the ball through somebody's window and you had to go get it repaired, that's where you took it. They repaired the windows and the screens. So let's get that, that apple fight. We broke, broke Hunt's window out. <laughs> Charlie Hunt lived what he did over here. So us kids went to see Charlie Hunt, and Charlie Hunt said, come and see me tomorrow. Pay for the window, you know. And I think it cost us five cents a piece. And uh, I think that's about the first I remember. Uh, you know, it's one of they didn't throw us kids out there because we was always up there. Well, I, I don't know what this town would have did if we had we'd have made it without Hunt's hardware. Because they, they could do everything. They could they could put your heat for you, put water for you, they had all the equipment you needed and uh, they were good. They were good people.
and then where I lived, we didn't get electricity until 1936, 37, one to two years. Um, but my father got into a real ac big accident in 1934. Um, my grandfather had a sawmill and they uh, would haul uh, logs, not logs, but uh, for, the, for the steel mills. <coughs> and uh, uh, he got, got into an accident so he couldn't work. And uh, here my mother was a real tiny, per small person, and uh, you know, pump it. She couldn't pump the the water. So uh, Pete Hunt and Charlie Hunt, that had Hunt's Hardware, come out and said, told my dad, said, "Red, you need uh, indoor plumbing." And my father says, "Well, I can't afford it. Can you afford a dollar a week?" <laughs> well, I could do that. So they put indoor plumbing, and we had a 250-gallon tank in the basement with a Briggs & Stratton one horse motor, and they'd kick-start it until it come up to pressure and shut off. And uh, my uncle uh, would come out once a week and start that pump up for us. Yeah, so, you know, it's, that was a little different. Everybody came to Bozak's. And I can remember I used to go bike riding with my girlfriend. We'd get our work done in the morning and then we'd spend the whole afternoon riding thousands of miles on our bikes and we'd stop in here and we both would just have pennies to spend. And Mrs. Bozak, I loved root beer popsicles. She would get an ice cream cone, I'd get a root beer popsicle, but I only had to, didn't have enough for a whole one. So she'd bust it in half and I'd buy a half one day and then the other half the next day, and she let me do that. What I loved most about Bozak's was they had their freezers right in front. They had two big windows up front, and then the doorway between the windows. That's before a car came crashing through the front of it. Everybody liked to come to Bozak's after school, and you'd get a pop and a bag of chips and sit in the booth and just talk and goof around. They had the best ice cream in the world. They made the best banana splits. Uh, Marguerite Harris worked here forever behind the counter, and she was just wonderful. But they didn't keep candy out where us kids could get it. The candy was always back behind the, the counter, and you'd have to get your Reese's peanut butter cups from, from Marguerite. She didn't like being interrupted for us kids getting our candy all the time. She still lived here. Uh, up in the last three or four years of her life, she lived here. And she moved into an apartment that was, well, she didn't have the stairs to crawl up and down. That was a 21 room apartment upstairs. It was a huge, well, was as big as this whole building. I cut it in half and made two apartments out of it. And uh, she was happy with that. She didn't have that big building to take care of. She just had her, her section of it. But, uh, so, yeah, we enjoyed this town growing up. This was Blanche Francis's store right here. Where Bozex is. Where Bozex was, yeah. And tell us about, um, tell us about that store. That store was this, like you see in the old-fashioned movies, that had the, I can remember the yard goods and the thread and that kind of stuff. And then in, in the front part of the store was the post office. They had the post office boxes in there. So you went in there to get your mail. And it was just unique. The only story I got about Roy and Prairie I'd like to tell is Hacker. Roy Hacker's garage, it was a or, uh, grocery store, it was a small one, and they had a meat block. And you go in to get your meat, and he had a cat that slept on it. And when you got your order of meat, he'd slap that cat off that meat block and then cut your meat. <laughs> Not once did I ever see him clean that meat block. <laughs> Old bobtail cat. I can remember when I was a kid going in hackers for groceries for my mom and the cat running across the counter and just climbing all over the, everywhere, <laughs> even where the meat was cut. I mean, it, it just crawled all over and up and down the, the uh, grocery stack. If you went into hacker, now this is something, and you ordered hamburger, he would go get a quarter of beef and spit his tobacco cod in his hand and throw it in the, in the stove and get his knife and cut you off a hunk of meat off of that 
quarter and grind up the hamburger. So, you know, and, uh, and it was, he ground it and you watched it, you know, so you know what it was, because he cut it right off of the old quarter beef. Once a week, he'd take my mother and us kids to Laporte, and you had to watch it because you sit in the back seat, he'd shoot tobacco. <laughs> and when he spit out the window, it'd come back on you if you wasn't careful. He had to duck. And I'll never forget that either. And I'd get car sick, and he'd take us to Lennox Dairy in Laporte and buy us each a great big ice cream. Oh, and yeah. we'd be car sick, and you got to eat your ice cream. And here I was, sicker than a oh. dog. We probably seven, eight years old, maybe. Uh, Roy Hacker would, uh, to save money, would go out and he'd buy a steer from a farmer, and he would uh, he would dress it down and butcher it himself, and put it in the cooler. And like you said, you could go in there and if you want a you want hamburger, he'd go out there and pull some of that beef off, cut it up, and grind it for you. You know. Old Hacker's Grocery, yeah. and, and like I say, when he died, because uh, I was he was in the store after original because we all was all upset and they his uh, one of his relatives said you do have no idea how much money the hackers got on the books mm -hmm. and it was uh, you know the depression was something else you know that we lived through uh, but I'm going to tell you in 1937 the de how the depression affected us. We never had any money. So I worked, uh, went down and helped some of my relatives in Argus. And a man had an onion patch and he hired me. I worked 10 hours a day and I got seven and a half cents an hour. Now you, you gotta believe this because at the end of the day, I had 75 cents. End of the week, I had $4.50. So the people I was staying with, uh, they always took their eggs to Plymouth. So I took my 50 cents and bought me a hamburger and a malt, and I saved my $4. So when I went home that year, I had $16, and I bought my school books. And what was the sweater that I said I always, it was? Angora. Angora sweater come out. And the girls went apy over them, so I had enough money to buy one of them sweaters, which I didn't have very long. But the sad thing, the girl that had my sweater that year, she, we was freshmen, and she was killed on Chicago Hill. The little, the gal that had my, which I was, was pretty popular back then, you know. So, but I made that much money on seven and a half cents an hour. But, and uh, we, I was tickled to death to get it because we didn't have no money whatsoever. It was tough. She knows, don't you? Well, my father was a banker and the depression hit. I was only a little kid, but I remember it just as if it was yesterday. And of course, the bank shut up and he was without a job. So I remember him going out for a job every single day and coming home and saying, I cannot find anything to do. Finally, he got a job in a butcher shop. Mom, my, mom, my mom and dad always got their, their groceries at, at Ludke's, which is the, uh, on the corner over there, and, uh, and so you could charge it. You know, you, you'd, pay, you'd, pay, uh, you'd pay your grocery bill every Friday or Saturday, whatever it is, you know. Oh yeah. He, well, the problem that the merchants had, it, they all had to charge the food and stuff. And they, had, they finally went broke because nobody could pay them. And they, could, they couldn't, you know, continue just buying this food and handing it out. And everybody had a charge account in those days. I know that's oh. what happened. With my dad, he had lots of people that charge and charge and charge, and, and you know, you get to a point where you have to pay to get the merchandise. When Ludke's, when the store, when he, when he shut it down, uh, Roy Hacker passed away, he shut it down. So you now I had no, now you didn't have grocery store. So now you had to go into Laporte. And the automobiles would go better now or then than it did in, in you know. Um, 
Yeah, it was. If you didn't live so that you have no die, what, no idea what it was like, and that's why I say that 75 cents then was big money, and I was tickled to death, and I had enough to buy my own school books, and so that was quite a deal. Well, it was a sad day, I know that, and I just was thankful my little kids were right. Yeah, it was about one o'clock in the morning, something like that, yeah. There was no uh, metal structures there. It was all wood. Once it started, you, could, you couldn't stop it. Uh, New Carlisle come in, Springfield Township come in, and I think Fish Lake came in, and uh, they brought in the snorkel from uh, Laporte City. It was quite, it was quite a fire. And then the next big one is the train wreck. <laughs> I don't, all I know is we got a call and went down there and uh, one train was going east and one was going west and I heard to, uh, later on that one of the, one of the uh, cars, the lumber shifted on the car and that's with her, and I don't know how many, 70, 80 cars that went off. An engineer and a conductor was killed. Well, we, you got all that diesel fuel, and and uh, you don't know what's in them cars. So, and there was a lot of fire, a lot of fire. No, I I uh, I really couldn't uh, really any uh, outstanding thing that happened here in Rolling Prairie that people told me about it. It's just that the uh, I was interested in the people and the, the way they lived and. Uh, it wasn't really any different than what we would, uh, anybody else lived. When I was 15 years old, a friend of mine, who I won't name because I haven't asked her if I could name her, but her and I would pull our money and there was a guy here in town for 50 cents, for an extra 50 cents, he'd buy you a six pack of beer. You'd give him money for the beer at an extra 50 cents. and wait out in front of Hunt's Hoosier Hardware and here he'd come all proud with your six pack and then we'd go between buildings and drink it or drink one with a straw maybe there'd be four or five of us and if you drank it through a straw you'd be sort of loopy right away. Did you tell him about your 16th birthday? Yeah my 16th birthday he walked up the railroad track I had a big party and he walked up the railroad track carrying me a chocolate cake and he had a present for me, and it was a gold bracelet. Well, it was beautiful, and I cherished that. Years later, he found out he was his well, mother. Well, I, I think my mother and them found out that she had the bracelet, so she had to give it back. Yep, <laughs> that's the only gold Or she bracelet. didn't have to, but she did. <laughs> First time I ever saw somebody unscrew the lid of a jar of peanut butter and stick their finger in and taste it and then put it back on the shelf and bought the other brand. I could not believe it. I was probably 10, 12 years old. And up until they started sealing jars, I would take the lid off to see if somebody had taken a, s scooped a finger through peanut butter. And I knew that lady. I could not look her in the face ever again after that, knowing what she did. There was no really great people that I'm aware of that came from Rolling Prairie, but they were all just common people and have common interests and common loves. One year, my wife told me, she says, you ought to put some lights up outside. And I said, I don't want to put any lights up outside. And she kept after me, so I put a few lights on the porch. And then she said, we ought to put a few more up. But she should have never told me that because my daughter says I have that, uh, that I do everything to excess. And once I got started, I didn't quit for 20, almost 25 years. 80,000 lights. There was a 200 amp service in the house, a 200 amp service in the garage. Everything was on timers. And from the 1st of November when I lit them till I shut them off the 6th of December, the meter would run at about every second and a half make a revolution. I and them loved me. It was fun. We enjoyed it. 
And I didn't realize the amount of people that after we uh, stopped doing it says, that was our family tradition. We did it when I was a kid, and now I'm taking my kids out. And I didn't realize that it had been going on that long. The day after the Christmas concert at the school, you didn't want to try to back out of the driveway because it was, it was a steady stream of cars coming from the school past the house. That night and Christmas Eve were the two heaviest nights. It was just a steady stream of cars coming. It's when you move away from here, you always want to go back and see your friends. I mean, no matter where you lived, if, you, if I moved to California, I think I would probably want to come back here for a vacation or something like that, you know? We didn't, we didn't always like each other, but we loved each other. You know, there was a common thread there. One of the big problems that got us, old people are, are dying, we're moving, we're moving on, you know. Uh, I just hope the youth that stays here will build it up, and I think they will.